Good afternoon. My name is Mei Lee Ku, and I'm the assistant director here at the Multicultural Center here at the University of Rhode Island. And it is my privilege today to introduce to you all uh, Dr. Michio Kaku at today's workshop titled Medicine of the Future. Uh, just to give a brief background, Dr. Kaku is the Henry Simat Professor of Theoretical Physics in the City College of New York, um, the co-founder of String Field Theory, a prominent futurist, best-selling author, and radio and TV personality. Um, we will have Dr. Kaku share some um, comments for the next half hour or so, and then I will take some questions at the end. If people would like to hear more from Dr. Kaku, he will be talking at tonight's 7 o'clock lecture. So please tune in on our URI live site. You can find that at the main URI website or off of the MCC website. Okay? So I present to you Dr. Michio Kaku. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, let me say that tonight I'll be talking about the next 100 years. What will society look like? What will the job market look like? What about multiculturalism? How will societies interact? What will a computer look like in 100 years? Uh, today, I'm going to focus just on the future of medicine. But tonight, I'll have a slideshow. I'll have pictures. What will a robot look like? How will we interface with doctors, with uh, our, our uh, fellow compatriots? How will we live in the future? That's going to be the theme of tonight's show with the slideshow pictures from the future, and also a DVD about a visit to the doctor's office 50 years from now. But today, I want to focus in on the future of medicine. First of all, I'm a physicist. So why should a physicist talk about medicine? First of all, we physicists invented the laser. We invented the transistor. We helped to create the first electronic computer. We also created the Internet. We wrote the World Wide Web. We also invented the MRI machine, the PET scan, the X-ray machine. We invented television. We invented radio. In fact, almost everything you see around you that is high technology was invented by a physicist. We're also the ones who decoded the DNA molecule. And they're all, we're also the ones who began the sequencing process of DNA. So we physicists have had an immediate impact on medicine, and we've also been curious about how our inventions and therapies have rippled through society. So first of all, let me say that medicine has gone through three basic stages. The first stage of medicine was witchcraft. It was a, a time, an era, when herbs were discovered. Some of these herbs were quite useful, like aspirin and certain herbal remedies, but for the most part, it was hit or miss, and it was based on superstition and witchcraft. The average lifespan during the first era was about 20 years of age. Most people died in childbirth. Basically, you were born, you lived a very short life, a miserable life, and died very young. Life's a bitch, as they say. <laughs> stage two is, quote, modern medicine. In stage two, three therapies and developments took place. First is sanitation. The introduction of sanitation alone expanded the lifespan by about 20 years. In the United States in the year 1900, life expectancy was 49 years of age. 49 years of age. During the Roman Empire, by the way, lifespan was about 30. Life expectancy was about age 30 during the Roman Empire. During the Middle Age, life expectancy actually dropped to around 25 because people did not believe in sanitation and bathing. Bathing was considered immoral. Queen Elizabeth, for example, probably never bathed at all and boasted about the fact. And that's why people had to have snuff boxes to hide the, the smell that people had. And there was no basic way of taking care of garbage. Uh, if you read books written in the Middle Ages, and you were walking through the streets of Rome, you had to dodge bones and the chicken parts that were thrown right outside the window. The garbage was basically right outside your window. There was no sanitation. There was no modern medicine as we know it. Life expectancy during most of the first era was about 20 years of age. But at the turn of the century, life expectancy in the United States rose to about 49. 
basic sanitation was coming in. And then also, 10 more years was added because of antibiotics, another 10 years because of vaccines and surgery. So that's where we are today. Now we are entering the third era. The third era of medicine is molecular and genomic medicine. You see, we don't know how, we didn't know how antibiotics work. We didn't know how vaccines work. It's only been in the last few years because of the introduction of physics to medicine that we've been able to finally figure out how vaccines work and how antibiotics work, believe it or not. It was hit or miss for the most part. For example, if you take a look at the salt vaccine and this, the, the vaccine of, of Sabine, it turns out that the weakened virus, uh, the weakened polio virus vaccine, actually reverts back to polio a certain fraction of the time. And this means that that vaccine is unstable. And we can actually see it now at the molecular level, at the genomic level. We can actually see why certain vaccines have to, have to be ruled out because they use a weakened variety of polio, and they can actually revert to the normal strain of polio and basically cripple you. So we can actually see this now at the molecular level. So now let me talk about precisely what it means to have molecular and genomic medicine. First of all, I've had most of my genes sequenced. For BBC television, they took a sample of my blood, they sent it out to Vanderbilt University, and I had most of my genes read. And my mother died of Alzheimer's, and I personally was curious about Alzheimer's disease. There is one gene that is implicated in Alzheimer's, it's not deterministic, but it's called the APO4E gene. And I had my gene sequenced, and I had BBC television put a TV camera right to my face, and they said, do you want to know? Do you want to know if you have the gene that killed your mother? And they wanted a response. My response was that, yes, I wanted to know because millions of people in the future will be faced with the very same question that I was facing in the filming process. We will have personal genomics on your credit card. Right now, it costs $50,000 to sequence every single gene in your body. That's dropping down very rapidly. In fact, for $50,000, you can even get the machine that does personalized gene sequencing now. And so the prices are going to be dropping dramatically over the next few years, down to the point where it may cost 100 bucks, and you may ha you even have it on your credit card at a certain point. And so this is going to change the face of medicine. And why is that? because of the computer revolution. Computers are doubling in power every 18 months. That's called Moore's Law. That in turn is driving the sequencing of genes. That's why genomics is moving so rapidly. It's because of the revolution in computers. For example, today when you get a birthday card saying happy birthday to you, there's a chip in it. That chip contains more computer power than all the Allied forces of 1945. Stalin, Hitler, Eisenhower would kill to get that chip. And what do you do with that chip? You throw it away in the garbage. That's Moore's Law. Moore's Law is now turning genomic medicine upside down to the point where genomic medicine may only cost 100 bucks, and you may find out where your ancestors came from 20,000 years ago. I found out because I had some of my blood sequenced at Cambridge University. They compared four of my genes to a database of 20,000 individuals, and they had a perfect match of four genes spread out on a map. On that map, I saw the trail that my mother's ancestors took going back about 20,000 years. So I now know pretty much the ancestral trail that my ancestors took as they marched across Asia. And you will too. You will have this because genomic medicine will make it all possible. So now let's be very specific about what it means for health and medicine. First, the human body shop. We're now getting very good at growing human organs of the body. And in tonight's uh, show, I will show you pictures 
of how we grow organs of the body from your own cells. You know that Mickey Mantle, the great Yankee great, died of liver failure. In the future, we will grow organs of the body from your own cells. From your cells today, we can grow skin, blood, bone, cartilage, noses, ears, blood vessels. We can also grow the bladder. The windpipe was grown just last year. And in five years' time, we will grow a liver from your own cells. This means that for you alcoholics in the audience, there's hope. We will grow livers from your own cells. How does it work? First of all, you get a piece of sponge-like material, which I'll show in the slideshow tonight. You seed it with ordinary cells. You hit it with growth factors. The sponge is shaped like an ear, like a nose. These cells proliferate inside the sponge, and then the sponge dissolves because it's biodegradable, leaving an ear, a nose. This is how we can literally grow organs of the body. And in 20, 30 years, we'll grow almost all the organs of the human body. I had a chance to take a film crew for the Science Channel down to Wake Forest University in North Carolina, and I had a chance to walk through the laboratory where they have jars, jars containing living human organs grown in the laboratory. It was like visiting Frankenstein's laboratory, except these body parts actually live, and they're taken from living people, and they will be reinserted back into the human body. So we will have a human body shop, and in the future, no one will die of organ failure. Organ failure will be something that people will no longer talk about because we will have a human body shop. Today, if you're in a car accident, of course, you go to the body shop to get your fender replaced. In the future, you will have your body parts replaced as well. Now, physics enters the picture because when we talk about cancer, that's one of the great killers, uh, second only to heart disease. However, when you take a look at the diagnoses that we physicists are coming up with, you have to realize that there are breakthroughs in two areas. First of all, cancer diagnosis. We can now create what are called DNA chips. DNA chips use silicon technology of Silicon Valley, that is ultraviolet photolithography, create, instead of transistors that are microscopic in size, we can create a DNA chip about the size of your fingernail that recognizes DNA, that recognizes proteins from cancer cells 10 years before they form a tumor. Now you know that Steve Jobs and Aretha Franklin are dying of pancreatic cancer. This has enormous cultural and scientific and economic reper uh, repercussions. Any textbook says that pancreatic cancer is fast growing, kills you in about three or so years, very aggressive. Well, the genes for pancreatic cancer were sequenced a few months ago, and there were some surprises. We now realize that some of the things we know about pancreatic cancer are wrong. First of all, it is not fast growing at all. It's slow growing. It takes 18 to 20 years for pancreatic cancer to kill you. But only in the last three or so years do you feel it. So in other words, you have pancreatic cancer growing in your body for decades, but you don't know it. And only in the final phases do you feel it and it kills you. In the future, DNA chips will be placed in your toilet three times a day you will have your gene sequence, that is the gene, the DNA for cancer and proteins emitted from cancer colonies and your toilet will tell you, watch out, you have pancreatic cancer, do something. You have 20 years. For example, if you feel a lump in your breast, it's too late. It's really too late. A lump in your breast means you have on the order of 10 billion cancer cells growing inside your breast. Surgery is required almost immediately. In the future, your toilet will tell you 
that it's picked up proteins emitted from a hundred cancer cells in a cancer colony and you have 10 years to do something about it. The point I'm raising is because of physics, the word tumor could disappear from the English language. We no longer say the words bloodletting. We no longer use leeches in a hospital. And in the future, the word tumor could very well disappear from the English language. Now that's cancer diagnosis. DNA chips may give us the point where we can identify most illnesses decades before they cause problems. But what about a cancer cure? This is where another area of physics comes in called nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is the ability to use individual molecules, molecules, as machines to carry out our wishes. Who is the master of nanotechnology? Mother Nature. You realize that Mother Nature can take hamburgers and french fries and create a baby in nine months out of hamburgers and french fries. Absolutely amazing. That's nanotechnology. And we physicists are now teasing apart some of the dynamics of nanotechnology, including how to attack cancer. You realize that when you have cancer, chemotherapy is required, but chemotherapy is horrible. First of all, your hair falls out, your skin turns parchy, you vomit. It is a hellish process because chemotherapy kills ordinary cells as well as cancer cells. What we need is a smart bomb, a smart bomb that targets only cancer cells, and we think we might have it. These are called nanoparticles. Nanoparticles are molecules, molecules that zero in on cancer cells, carry poisons, and kill the cancer cells. And one study, 90% effective against tumors. Now, there are many varieties of nanoparticles being looked at by physicists and chemists. One of them is as follows. If I take a cancer cell, it has large, raggedy holes on the surface. A normal cell has smooth, small holes on the surface. We can now make a molecule halfway between the two. It is too large to fit inside the small holes. It's too big to fit inside the small round holes of an ordinary cell, but it goes right into the raggedy large holes of a cancer cell. In other words, it flows right into cancer, but it bounces off ordinary cells because of its size. And it carries a poison, a chemotherapy poison, and it delivers that poison right to the cancer cell and kills it. Another way that we're looking at is have antibodies on the cancer cell which zero in on cancer, and then we use either lasers or electromagnetic devices to make these nanoparticles shake. And they shake very rapidly, and they destroy the cell wall of the cancer cell. These nanoparticles attach themselves to cancer cells. We can then excite them using physics, using electromagnetic waves, laser beams, to shake, and then they destroy the cancer cell. So what I'm saying is we now have the potential of yet a whole new way of attacking cancer. If you have cancer today, what are you going to do? The surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. We're not talking about, well, things like angiogenesis and other kinds of ways of hitting cancer using smart bombs. But systematically knocking out cancer using nanoparticles is at the forefront now of our battle against cancer. So this is something that we're looking at very, very carefully. And it could really change everything. Now let me say another thing. We physicists are also interested in the brain. We want to be able to tease apart the thinking process. Because thinking itself is a physical process. Now how do we do it? First of all, at Brown University, not too far from here, they've been able to take stroke victims who are vegetables. They cannot communicate with the outside world, massive damage to the person's brain, and they're like a vegetable trapped inside a body. We can now take some of these stroke victims, put a chip in their brain, 
hooked the chip to a laptop where they can look at the cursor and they can begin to move the cursor on the screen by thinking. These people can now read email, write email, surf the web, play video games, do crossword puzzles, and they are paralyzed. This now has opened the door using high technology to access the mind of a thinking person. In fact, one of my colleagues, Stephen Hawking, the cosmologist, he has lost control over all his organs. He cannot even use his finger anymore. He communicates with the outside world by blinking, blinking and grimaces of the face. That's how he communicates with the outside world. Some people are thinking that maybe we'll put my colleague, Stephen Hawking, in such a machine, put an electrode in his brain, hook the electrode to a laptop computer, and then he can start to dictate equations and dictate books just by pure thought. Now what this means is that in the future, when we interact with computers, we'll probably interact with, with computers mentally. We will simply think and our wishes will be carried out. This is the power of a god. The power of a god is to think something and then have the material world carry out your wishes. We're going to come very close to this because we're going to be able to decipher the nature of human thought and carry these thoughts out. Now, what is the practical application for this? Right now, the immediate practical application is twofold. One is to be used as a lie detector. It's not perfect, but when you tell the truth, an MRI scan of the brain shows that your brain does not light up too much. When you tell a lie, first of all, you have to create the lie. You have to know the truth. Then you have to calculate the consistency of the lie with all the other lies you've been telling all these years. That's a lot of brain power. Your brain lights up like a Christmas tree. In fact, I'll show a picture of it tonight. So it is fairly, fairly easy to use the MRI as a crude lie detector test simply because the brain uses up a tremendous amount of energy when it tells a lie, but uses up very little energy when it tells the truth. In addition to this, at Kyoto University, they want to photograph a dream. Now this is once considered science fiction. In fact, it is the stuff of science fiction. Uh, if you take a look at uh, the movie Total Recall with Arnold Schwarzenegger, there have been many movies talking about imprinting memories into the brain, extracting memories from the brain. And we actually think it's possible. In Kyoto, they made the first step by being able to photograph thoughts. First of all, in Kyoto, they put a dot in somebody's field of vision. And that dot then lit up a certain part of the brain. Of course, it's gibberish. We don't know how to read these signals. But a dot corresponds to a certain pattern of the brain. Then they moved the dot. Then the pattern changed. They moved the dot again, and the pattern changed again. In fact, they moved the dot in all possible configurations. Now, a picture is the sum of dots. Therefore, by looking at the brain's image, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between pixels and brain images. And then they showed patterns of, X, patterns of dots, Xs, Us, and sure enough, bingo. You could actually see the patterns light up in the brain corresponding to an X, corresponding to a U. Now, when you dream, your cerebral cortex, <clears throat> I mean your, your brain lights up in the same way, at, more or less, as your brain when it undergoes normal um, visual analysis. So we can actually see the brain as it dreams, but we can't read the dreams. It's just gibberish on an MRI machine. Now we can begin the process of thinking about decoding the dream in the same way that we can now decode the conscious mind's attempt to scan certain images. In science now, scientists have been able to get a dictionary between certain images, like dog or a cat or a house, 
and brain scans. It's not perfect, but there is a dictionary that we can create between images and patterns on the brain. We can do that using the conscious brain, but now we can also begin to think about this with the unconscious brain, that is, the brain when it dreams. And it is definitely possible that in the coming years we'll be able to photograph crude outlines of what you're dreaming about. Now, the immediate application, however, is that the brain may be able to access objects because we can use computers to read the thought patterns of the brain. The Japanese are pioneering this technology. They've taken a, a worker, they put on an electroencephalograph on the per, a, uh, person's head, a computer decodes the thought patterns and shoots it into a robot. The robot can then move its arms and legs according to the person's thoughts. Now, where have you seen that before? That is Avatar. When you think of the movie Avatar, you're talking about somebody being placed in a pod, controlling another entity. This, is, this could be the future of robotics. You realize that the space program is quite dangerous. Having a base on the moon is very dangerous because of radiation, micrometeorites, uh, the lack of oxygen. Wouldn't it be easier to put a robot on the moon and have the robot controlled by a worker on the Earth? He simply goes into a pod, just like the movie Avatar, brain scans then read the person's images, sends the message to the moon, and we have a moon base without any of the health issues. This is something seriously being looked at because the Honda Corporation has already done this with Asimo, their robot, and with a worker with a helmet on. So this means that in the future, we may be able to use MRI machines in some sense as a way to read the human brain. Now, you may say to yourself, well, there's a problem. MRI machines are huge. Have you ever seen an MRI machine? They weigh like five tons. They occupy half this room. However, they're really neat because you can actually see inside the thinking brain. BBC Television put me in an MRI machine because they wanted to know where the human clock was located. We have a clock in our brain. We're able to tell seconds, minutes, hours, days. So there should be a part of the brain that actually counts the seconds, counts the minutes. Well, there is. Right behind your eyes, right behind your eyes in the brain, there is a small peanut-shaped object which counts the seconds. It is your clock. So BBC Television put me in an MRI machine and had me count one, two, three. They analyzed my brain and bingo. It lit up like a Christmas tree at that one spot right between your eyes. Now, I had to be placed in this gigantic machine at Duke University. In the future, we will have it perhaps the size of a cell phone. First of all, when I was in high school, I had a summer job at Varian Associates. And my boss was a guy named Dr. Paul Ernst. He was a Swiss physicist. Well, Paul Ernst went on to win the Nobel Prize in Physics for the creation of the MRI machine. This is his creation. Why do we have to have such a large magnetic field? Because it has to be uniform. The more uniform the magnetic field, the greater the resolution. If the magnetic field is small, weak, or distorted, then the resolution is also distorted. That's where computers come in. We can now use computers to compensate for the irregularity of the magnetic field. You don't need to have a gigantic magnetic field that's uniform because you can use computers to massage the data to compensate for the fact that you're using a weak magnetic field that's irregular. The world's smallest MRI machine, I'll show it tonight, is this big. It's the size of a briefcase, the world's smallest MRI machine. You probably heard about the Iceman the Iceman died between the border of Switzerland and Italy, I think, thousands of years ago. But when he died, he died in a very irregular shape. So they cannot put him in an MRI machine. 
To be placed in an MRI machine, you have to be basically cylindrical. His body was frozen thousands of years ago in an irregular shape. Because the world's smallest MRI machine is only this big, it is very easy to MRI the Iceman. And they did. We can now, for the first time, look right inside a man who died thousands of years ago and basically was uh, petrified by, I mean solidified by the ice. Then the question is, how small can you make an MRI machine? The answer is the size of a cell phone. What is this? This is the tricorder of Star Trek. Look at, think of Star Trek. Spock has this device. He holds it in his hand. He scans your body. And all of a sudden, he can see inside your body, analyze your bodily functions. Most critics thought, ha, what nonsense. How can you possibly have one device the size of a cell phone that can analyze everything inside the body? We will have it. Compliments of physics. We will have the tricorder, a device with DNA chips, a device with MRI machines, uh, magnetic fields, with advanced software. You simply scan the person and you can figure out what ails the person and what's inside. Now the next question is, how will we interact with a doctor in the future? I'll show pictures in a video tonight of a visit to the doctor's office. But let's talk about your living room. Your living room will, first of all, have a wall screen about the size of this wall. It'll be 360 degrees. We already have these. These are called the cave. The military has perfected this. I had a chance to fly down to Fort Benning, Georgia, with a film crew from the Science Channel, and we photographed your living room of the future. Your living room of the future has wall screens on all four sides. As you move, the wall recognizes the position of your head and changes all the perspectives as you move your head. So I had a chance to hunt dinosaurs in the cave. As I moved my head, I could put myself on top of a dinosaur. I put myself on top of a T-Rex, and I could hunt other dinosaurs. As I moved, I saw everything around me also move as I rode on top of a T-Rex. This already exists. This is your living room. So how will you access a doctor in the future? Well, we all know the doctors don't like to make house calls. So in the future, you'll go to the wall, and you'll say, mirror, mirror on the wall. I want to see a doctor. And an animated doctor will appear. The doctor looks like a doctor, talks like a doctor, answers your questions like a doctor, except it is a software program. And this means that 95% of your ordinary medical questions will be answered by RoboDoc. You will have RoboDoc in the wall. Any time of the day, bingo, there's your doctor, right, making a house call. And then you say, well, wait a minute. What happens if the doctor has to do an x-ray scan or has to do a test? Well, that's where the tricorder comes in. Your bathroom will have more computer power than a modern university hospital in the future. Your toilet will analyze your bodily fluids and tell you that you will have cancer in 10 to 20 years. Your bathroom mirror, you'll blow on it. Water vapor will condense on the bathroom mirror. We already have this, by the way. It'll analyze a mutated P53 gene, which is implicated in 50% of all common cancers. Your bathroom wall mirror will tell you that you have lung cancer. This, is, this already exists. This is not science fiction. It's just a little bit expensive. And in the future, your bathroom mirror will tell you if you have lung cancer. Your toilet will analyze proteins to find out what's happening inside your body. And when you talk to the wall, RoboDoc will emerge. Also, RoboLawyer. The law, 95% of common legal questions can be answered by artificial intelligence. Okay? Now, let me tell you what we're not going to have and what we are going to have. RoboDoc and RoboLawyer use what are called expert systems. It's a branch of artificial intelligence theory. You deal with intelligent systems, uh, expert systems, when you're on the telephone and somebody answers and says, you know, punch number one, hit number two for number three. That's an expert system. It's an expert system that has knowledge that can be answered by a yes or no question. Push number one 
push number two. Except now you can download the entire medical library of a doctor, the entire medical library of a lawyer, of a, uh, and put it on, put it in an animated figure, and have the person interact with you and answer most of your legal questions. Now, as you know, the human population is aging in the developed nations. We're going to be faced with a huge medical crisis. We're going to have a lot of sick old people, and we're going to have to have some way to reduce medical costs. This is one way to do it. Now, let me tell you another thing. Some of you are, some of you are young, so let me warn you about the future, which is not going to be very pleasant, but it's about time you, you heard about this. People, because of entitlement programs, for every dollar they put into these entitlement programs, they take out two dollars. Now, common sense tells you that's unsustainable. You cannot put in one dollar to an entitlement program like Social Security or Medicare and get back two dollars, right? It's unsustainable. But that's the way it is. Wake up. So how is it possible that the United States didn't go bankrupt decades ago? It's because my generation, the baby boomer generation, didn't mind paying extra taxes because it's our parents. How can you deny your parents good medical care? How can you deny your parents a good life? And there are a lot of us in the baby boomer generation, so we didn't mind so much. So we, we kept on paying huge Social Security taxes in order to make sure that old people can take out $2 for every $1 they put in. Well, those times are gone. And you guys are going to feel the brunt of it. Because there are not that many people in the next generation after the baby boomers. And the baby boomers are going to say, well, look, my parents took out two dollars for every dollar they put in, and I'm going to do the same. And yet, who's going to pay for it? You guys? I don't think so. What's going to happen is, when you guys retire, the bank could be broken. Literally. Bankrupt. Okay? You realize that Medicare and Social Security are some of the largest growing areas of the federal budget? It's going to bankrupt the country. And there are not enough young people your age to support the baby boomer generation because there are a lot of us. We didn't mind financing our parents' generation. But are you going to finance the baby boomer generation? I don't know. That's where RoboDoc, RoboLawyer come in. We're going to have to have some way to drive down the cost. Another way is artificial intelligence in the form of robots. So let me say a few things about robots. Japan is the world's leader in robots. Get on the web, just type in robots, you'll see that most robots are made in Japan. 30% of all commercial robots are made in Japan. First of all, the question is, why? Why is Japan putting so much money into robots? And second, how intelligent are they? Can they change the medical system of, of the United States? First of all, the reason why Japan is putting so much money into robots is because the Japanese population is aging faster than any other population on the planet Earth. Last year, the birth rate and death rate flipped for the first time in modern history. The Japanese population is now contracting. It's unheard of, but it is now contracting. Birth rate is like 1.2, 1.3 children per family. It is one of the lowest in the world for a developed nation. So we have a lot of old people. In fact, Japanese women for 20 years have held a record for the oldest living ethnic group on the planet Earth. It is unsustainable. No young people, young people are not being born in large quantities. Birth rate is very low. Immigration is very low. And the population is aging very rapidly. Welcome to the future. Who's next? Switzerland, Austria, Germany are next. It turns out that many of the prosperous European nations also have a plunging birth rate. Even Italy, a Catholic country for God's sake, has a plunging birth rate. Okay? And so who's going to take care of all these old people? Robots. 
That's where robots come in. That's why Japan is putting so much money into robotics, because the population is aging faster than any other population on the planet Earth. And Europe is next. What about the United States? Do we have a birth rate of 1.2 children per family, which is unsustainable? No, our birth rate is 2.1, 2.2, mainly because of immigration. If it wasn't for immigration, the native indigenous population in this country would also be plunging. So, something's got to give. One possibility is artificial intelligence. And then the question is, well, how smart are they? How smart are our robots? If you were to take an animal and compare an animal to Asimo, our most advanced robot that I'll show tonight, how intelligent is our most advanced robot? Our most advanced robot has the intelligence of a cockroach, a stupid cockroach, a lobotomized stupid cockroach. Our machines can barely recognize what they are looking at. It takes them five to six hours for them to recognize the objects of a room and simply walk across a room. That's how stupid our robots are. So what's the problem? Hollywood has us brainwashed into thinking that just around the corner, Skynet's going to take over the world. We're all going to be put in zoos. Our robot creations will throw peanuts at us, make us dance behind bars. All a bunch of nonsense. How advanced are our most robots? And what's the problem? Two problems. Listen carefully, because this affects the job market of the future. Will you be replaced by a robot? Think about it. There are two things robots cannot do. Forget about every single Hollywood movie you've ever seen. They're all raw. Every single science fiction movie you've ever seen, raw. There are two reasons why we don't have robots, which is also the answer to the question, who will have jobs in the future? The people who have jobs in the future are the jobs that cannot be replaced by robots. So then the question is, what can a robot do? Let me tell you. There are two things robots cannot do. First is robots can see much better than you, but they don't understand what they are seeing. Pattern recognition is a huge problem. That's why robots cannot recognize objects around the room. They cannot navigate very well. They bump into things. You put a cup in front of a robot, it takes them hours to analyze a cup from all directions. And after a few hours, the robot says, cup. <laughs> okay? That's how difficult it is to recognize pattern. You do it in a split second. But robots take hours. And if you move the cup from a different angle, it's all, it all gets confused again. Pattern recognition, okay? This means that, then I'll give you the second reason in, in a second. This means that the jobs of the future will be those jobs, among others, that require pattern recognition. For example, some people think that gardeners, police, construction workers are all going to be on the unemployment line. Wrong. Every construction site is different. Robots cannot become construction workers. Robots can only do repetitive tasks like automobile workers, the same repetitive task over and over again. That's what robots can do because robots do not have pattern recognition capability. They don't understand what they are looking at. This means that garbage men, sanitation workers, policemen, construction workers, non-repetitive work, they will have jobs in the future. Repetitive work, they're out the window. Okay? Now the second thing, affects middle-class workers. Why don't we have middle-class workers now? And the answer is common sense. You know that water is wet. You know that strings can pull, strings cannot push. You know that sticks can push, sticks cannot pull. You know that mothers are older than their daughters. You know that animals do not like pain. And you know that when you die, you don't come back the next day. Now let me ask you a question. How did you know that? How did you know that strings can pull, but strings cannot push? How did you know that mothers are older than their daughters? How did you know that water is wet and not dry? Well, that's common sense. 
Everybody knows that, right? Everybody but robots. Robots have never seen string. They've never seen mothers older than their daughters. They've never seen animals die. You have to train them to do this. There's no law of calculus that says the sticks can push, sticks can't pull. This is common sense. So how many lines of common sense are there that you can program into a robot? Hundreds of millions of lines of common sense to duplicate the common sense of a five-year-old child. Children instinctively know these things because they've touched water. They know that water is not dry. They've seen mom. Mom is older than the daughters. They interact with the reality. So the jobs of the future will be those jobs that require common sense. That is, leadership, analysis, artwork, telling a joke, making a movie script, writing a novel, creating an equation. Those jobs that require inventory, bean counting, tracking inventory, those jobs are going to be wiped out. You know, when I came here, or when I travel around the world, I get on a computer and I get the cheapest ticket. Somebody lost a job. A middle class person lost a job. You realize that the jobs of the future that are middle class, that are going to be obliterated, are those jobs in the middle. Middle level repetitive kinds of jobs are doomed. Low level accounting, low level brokerage, low level agency work. They're going to get wiped out. You know that Merrill Lynch used to boast that people will always buy stock the old-fashioned way? They will always go to a human to buy stock, and they were proud of it. Well, in one of the most embarrassing incidences in the history of Wall Street, Merrill Lynch had to eat crow to set up an online brokerage division. Because today, on the computer, you can buy stocks. You don't have to talk to a human. So why do you need a human? You need a human to provide common sense. If you're, if you're going to buy a house or buy a stock, are you going to do it on your wristwatch? Well, yeah, in the future, you'll be able to buy a house on your wristwatch. But are you going to buy a house on a wristwatch? No. You want to talk to an agent who understands where the good areas are, good schools, High crime, bad sewage system, good government. That's why you need a human. So middle level jobs that require common sense will survive. Middle level jobs, middlemen jobs, the friction of capitalism, those jobs that do not require common sense, they're gone. So you now know the future of the job market. Think of the job that you want to become. Think of the person you want to become in the future. And ask yourself a simple question. Can a robot replace my job? And the answer is very simple. Does your job require pattern recognition or common sense? That's the criterion. Okay? And then you begin to realize that, oh my God, a whole bunch of jobs are going to go out the window. Okay? Do not become a stockbroker unless you can provide analysis of stocks. When you buy stocks today, the company says, we provide expertise, know-how, experience. We have a team of top analysts in the back room understanding all the motions of the stock market. That's the company you're going to go for, not the company that simply says, hey, you know, we have people that make tr stock transactions for you. So in other words, the point I'm raising is something very simple. The jobs of the future, including those for medicine, will be those jobs that cannot be done by artificial intelligence. And now let me say a few things about the economy in general, and then I'll open it up to discussion on the floor. Society in general is making a transition from commodity capital to intellectual capital. For example, this morning, you had breakfast that the King of England could not have had 100 years ago. Think of what you had for breakfast today. You had breakfast very cheaply, commodities shipped from all over the world that the King of England
could not have had 100 years ago. That's how cheap certain commodities have become because of better containerization, mass production, shipping, competition. But software, intellectual capital, artwork, telling a joke, writing a story, that's intellectual capital that has gone up, not down. Tony Blair, former Prime Minister of England, liked to boast the fact that England derives more revenue from rock and roll than it does the coal mining industry. Now think about that. When you think of a British worker, you think of the coal mining industry. And yet England derives more revenue from rock and roll than it does the coal mining industry. What's the difference? Coal is a commodity. Not all commodities go down. Oil goes up. Certain commodities that China wants, they go up because of supply and demand. But on the whole, commodities like food have been dropping in price. But intellectual capital has been going up, including rock and roll. Now, why is that? You cannot mass produce the brain. You can mass produce steel. You can mass produce eggs. You can mass produce most com commodities but you cannot mass produce the brain. And this is where this university comes into the picture. We are witnessing a transition in the economy of the United States. The jobs that you are going to strive for, some of them may not exist by the time you graduate and enter the job market. So you have to be very careful. The country is making a transition from commodity capital to intellectual capital. Intellectual capital is not just rock and roll. It's not just software. It's anything that requires the human imagination. That is common sense. The world economy now is going in the direction of common sense. Things that robots cannot do. Imagination, artwork, creativity, leadership, experience, know-how, scientific theory, telling a joke, writing a novel, becoming an actor. These are things robots cannot do. And these are the things that are going to be driving the economy into the future. Okay, let me just summarize, and then we'll open it up to questions. In summary, what I want to say is that as a physicist, we physicists are creating the architecture for medicine into the next century. We're going to be creating devices that can probe the brain, Devices that go right into the molecular structure of the body. Devices that can cheaply sequence genes. Devices that are appearing in your wall screen and can talk to you very cheaply. And this is going to change everything because we're entering the third era of medicine. Molecular medicine, medicine that is done at the level of molecules and genes. And in the coming years, all of you will have your gene sequenced. All of you will have the database of your genes on a credit card or a CD-ROM. All of you will have access to the devices that we're talking about today. And hopefully in the future, the aging process, cancer, things like this will be considered um, something of the past. The word tumor could gradually disappear from the English language. Um, I didn't mention the aging process tonight. I'll talk about how we physicists believe that maybe your grandkids may have the option of hitting the age of 30 and just staying at 30 and just spending decades at age 30, okay? This is something that your grandkids may have the option of doing, and I'll show you how tonight. Okay, so any questions? We'll throw it open. Yeah. Oh, hold on, please. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Let's um, I just have to say, I do have aspirations of being a comedian, so maybe there's hope for me in the future. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would like to start by just having some questions in the room, uh, and then if there are questions in the back, I'll take some, but if not, I'll just continue with the questions. And we probably have about maybe 10 minutes or so, so we'll try to get in as, as many questions as, as we can in that time frame. So, Joe, I saw you had your hand up. What are the... What are the uh, feedback systems that the people are looking at in science right now that is linking the information to the biology, and how do you see those systems being used to enhance human intelligence as well as AI? 
Oh, which feedback mechanisms are you looking at? For instance, you talked about uh, nanotechnology and mm -hmm. how those systems go in to, and they know how the cells uh, function throughout the life span. Uh, much like that where the whole pattern itself is very repetitive and basic functions of life as well as uh, patterns in a way without, I guess, the complete and complex pattern recognition. Well, you mentioned intelligence, and let me tell you right now that um, it is extremely difficult for scientists to change uh, human intelligence, because first of all, we don't even know what it is. However, at the genetic level in animals, we've been making some inroads, uh, scientists have been able to isolate the smart mouse gene. The smart mouse gene <clears throat> is a gene that makes mice smarter. That is, they have better memory. They remember tasks much better than ordinary mice. They learn much faster than ordinary mice. And that gene is also found in humans as well. Not only that, but in groups like at Caltech and other universities, they've been able to isolate the essence of certain memories. Now, remember in Harry Potter, there's that scene where Harry Potter draws out a piece of memory, a little sliver of memory from some guy's brain. We may have something like that pretty soon. It turns out that in mice, the processing of the brain goes through one small organ of the, of the brain. Scientists have been able to, as a tape recorder, simply record the impulses that went through the mouse's brain when the mouse learned a certain task. Okay? We don't know what these impulses are. We just tape recorded it. Then they gave it a drug that made the mouse forget the task that it just learned. So the mouse no longer has a memory. Then they shot that same tape recording back into the mouse's brain, and the mouse immediately knew what to do. So in other words, we can now actually, at the, at the level of neurons, a neur neuronic activity, create little snippets of memory and inject the memory back into a mouse. And then the question is, how far can you carry this? Well, so far, we've only done it for one task. But in principle, we may be able to do it for many tasks. And in, in principle, it may be possible even to do it for humans, because our brain is rather similar to a mouse's brain, except, of course, it's much more complicated. But this is just the beginning, because in Hollywood movies like you know the Harry Potter series, you can play with these memories. All I'm saying is that we don't know how to read these memories, but we can tape record them and shoot them back into the brain, and the brain recognizes it instantly. All right, other questions? Um, Melvin? You have to speak up to the mic, doesn't project in the room. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kaku, my question has to do with your comments about the regeneration of different organs. I think you have mentioned previously that uh, all organs except the human brain would be uh, uh, able to be regenerated. Why is the human brain an exception? Well, we think that it may be possible to inject stem cells directly into the human brain, not to increase your IQ or memory, but simply to integrate into the brain so that you, you have to learn how to ride a bicycle again. You have to learn how to do certain tasks, but your brain is capable of absorbing all these tasks that you are learning. So the problem with the brain is different. The brain contains information. And that information, we don't know how to decode. As I said before, for the mouse brain, we simply tape record memories and inject them back into the mouse brain. We can't decipher them from first principles. So we'll, we're able to grow organs of the body because we simply look at structure. The brain has more than structure, it has information. And that's why it's very difficult to restructure the brain. However, in the future there is talk of simply injecting embryonic stem cells into the brain, allowing these brain cells to reintegrate in whatever fashion it is, and then having to learn how to ride a bicycle again. You see, our brain is not a digital computer. That was a mistake made 50 years ago. Our brain is not a computer at all. A computer has programming, it has Windows, it has a Pentium chip, and it has an operating system. 
Our brain has no windows, no operating system, no Pentium chip, no software, no programming, no subroutines. Our brain is a neural network. It's a learning machine. It simply rewires itself every time it learns a new task. That's why the brain is quite different from a, from a digital computer. Well, I wrote my question down. Um, well, now, you sometimes have reference ideas of the science fiction versus the uh, reality of the future. And, like, me being a filmmaker made me think about, like, movies. So I thought about The Matrix and how you can wire people's brains into a program. Like, will that be possible in the future? Because it seems as if, well, from what I've heard, that the study of dreams and imaging them into, like, projecting them into an image is kind of like the, bir the birthplace of that study, which would be virt a virtual world. Uh, first of all, I'll show pictures tonight of living in the Matrix. We will live in a world very similar to the movie The Matrix. Your living room will be 360 degrees, wall screens in all directions, sensing the motion of your head, and the Internet will be in your contact lens. You will blink and you will go online. We will create entire worlds right inside your contact lens. I'll show a picture of this tonight. Okay. So that aspect of the matrix we think we have under control. The creation of artificial reality, the creation of, of new worlds so simply by, by changing the software program. But the matrix goes even beyond that. The matrix talks about injecting whole sequences of knowledge into the brain. We cannot do that yet. All we've been able to do is for a mouse brain inject one snippet of memory of one task into a mouse brain. That's the state of the art. That's as far as we've gotten. However, we have our foot in the door. Okay? Even that was considered impossible just a few years ago to be able to recreate one memory in a mouse. We've done that now. So now it means that we'll be able to create more sophisticated memories, but then perhaps your memories are not the same as my memories. Our brain is a neural network. It's not a digital computer that uses Windows. Windows is used by all computers. Therefore, all computers can talk to each other. Each brain is different. Okay? Even twins would have different brains because our brain is a neural network that rewires itself after it learns every task. So it's not clear that if you have a motion picture that you inject into a person's brain, whether you can inject that same motion picture into another person's brain. It's not clear. But again, we're not even at the stage yet where we, where we can even test that theory. We're only at the stage now where we can play with one memory at a time in an animal. Dr. Walters, you had a question? Thanks. Yeah, I'm wondering whether uh, medical ethics is going to keep pace with medical technology so that everyone would have access to creating his or own, her own cells or to the, the services that would allow those cells to be created through the technology, through the screens in your living room, or what have you. Will everyone have access to being able to um, have those cells reproduce? Well, the ethical questions are enormous. And therefore, in my book, I've had several chapters talking about the implications of these things. What we're headed for is designer children. That's the direction that gene therapy, that a lot of this is going. We're going to be able to change the genetic heritage of our children. And then the question is, who should do it? And how far should we go in terms of changing that genetic heritage? First of all, in terms of cost, costs have been dropping enormously, uh, simply because computer power doubles every 18 months, meaning that computers are twice as powerful for the same dollar every, every 18 months. Uh, when the computer first came out, people were talking about the digital divide. They were saying we will have the digital rich and the digital poor, and society will suffer. Well, that's a bunch of nonsense. Uh, we could have told, we physicists could have told you that in the future, teenagers, uh, preteens are all going to be wired up on Facebook. If you're a kid and you're not wired up, you don't exist. You, you, you don't exist. What? You don't have a handle? What? You're not on the web? Kids will big borrow steel to get on the internet today. Otherwise, they, they don't exist as a, as a kid. Okay? Access was not the problem. The problem is jobs. That's the problem. The job market is changing very rapidly. Entry-level jobs. 
that was the conveyor belt for millions of immigrants from Ireland and Italy and and those those entry level conveyor belt jobs a lot of them are gone okay the economy has changed from commodity capital more and more toward intellectual capital and that's why the when when people begin to devote all their energy to talking about the digital divide they miss the boat the job market is what is changing. I was just in Detroit uh, two, uh, last week filming with um, the Discovery Channel. We, we, we filmed at a blast furnace last week talking about the early earth. But just going through the streets of Detroit is obvious that they missed the boat because they're stuck into, in commodity capital. They're stuck into an early era and we are no longer in that era. While other places like Pittsburgh, the Rust Belt, they're thriving because Pittsburgh made a made a conscious effort to go from the era of commodity capital into the era of, of intellectual capital. Now with biology, some of these therapies will be expensive at the beginning, but costs are just going to keep on dropping. Just like I said, gene sequencing. To sequence the first human being, it costs three billion dollars. Three billion dollars to sequence the first human being, uh, James Watson. Now it costs 50,000 to sequence one human being, now it's going to get go even below that. They're talking about a thousand dollar genome just in the next few years. A thousand dollar genome. After that, the hundred dollar genome. So we're talking about access not being the problem. The problem is how is this going to change society itself, the job market, and also the genetic heritage of our children. How will we decide? How far are we going to push this technology? Let's say, for example, that someone comes out with a way of commercializing the smart mouse gene. And there's a rumor that your neighbor's kid has a smart mouse gene. That's going to put pressure on you to, you know, genetically modify your kids as well. Even if you don't want to, your kid is going to be competing against another kid who's been genetically modified. You see how it goes? There's going to be lots of competition. And these therapies will initially be very expensive, but eventually they will start to drop in, in cost. Then an illegal black market could form. Maybe you go to Hong Kong and get access to genes that are totally illegal, but are sold on the open market. You know, we can't stop heroin. We can't stop heroin. What happens when illegal genes go on the black market? Parents will pay. Parents will pay to have certain genes for their kids that are illegal. This, this could be a possibility. Uh, the immediate impact is going to be on sports. That's going to be the first uh, industry to be hit pretty hard by this. Uh, the Olympics already set up a special subcommittee, one of my friends is on it, to study this. In addition to the smart mouse gene, we've also isolated the mighty mouse gene. The mighty mouse gene, I have a picture of it tonight, it shows a rat twice as big as an ordinary rat, twice as bulked up, really with like a muscle-bound rat. It was called the mighty mouse gene until we found a young boy in Germany who has the same gene. He's also bulked up. His mother was a professional sprinter in Germany. He was analyzed. It's the same gene, identical, the, the Mighty Mouse gene. They can't call it the Mighty Mouse gene anymore. Now they call it the Schwarzenegger gene. <laughs> We've isolated this, okay? And at the University of Pennsylvania, one of the scientists there was rather depressed because when they made the announcement to the press, 50% of all the phone calls coming in did not come from doctors worried about muscular dystrophy and the atrophying of the muscles of their patients. No. 50% of the phone calls came from bodybuilders, professional bodybuilders. They wanted to know one question, how to bulk up. That's all they wanted. They didn't care about the consequences. They didn't care about what it does to the body. How can I get it? That's the only thing they wanted to know. So, hey, professional sports is going to be one of the early casualties of this. The Olympics Committee has set up the study group because you cannot detect it with steroid tests. There's no steroid test that, that can detect the presence of, of this gene. That gene has since been studied. We actually know how it works now. And uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure on professional athletes to get a hold of that gene. All right, for the sake of time, I could only take two more questions, if, if that's OK. So we'll go to here, and then to Alice. And then I apologize for other people who could not ask, ask their question. Um, well, you spoke about uh, the middle class losing jobs and stuff like that. And um, I just want to ask, because you said that uh, in the future we'll be able to have like a, a, a human body shop in which we would be able to make 
all the organs needed. So why couldn't you just make a brain and keep it alive inside a robot and then just have them do all the other things too? Well, that's been looked at by science fiction writers, but I'd say we may be 100 years, 100 years from being able to even come close to transporting the human brain from, from a human to a robot or a robot back to a human again. Um, the brain is one huge frontier, and we're very ignorant of it. The brain has about 100 billion cells, and that's as many stars as there are in the galaxy. Each cell in turn, each neuron, is connected to 10,000 other neurons, creating what is called a neural net, a learning machine. That's what our brain is. It simply learns tasks, rewires itself after learning every task. So it's not like a digital computer, like a Pentium chip. You can remove a Pentium chip from a brain, okay? You cannot do that with our brain. Also, uh, a digital computer, if you remove one transistor in the wrong place of the brain, uh, of a robot, uh, the whole robot goes kaput. You, you remove one transistor. The human brain is different. It's plastic because it is a neural network. You can remove half the brain, half the brain, and still survive. Okay? In fact, there was one young girl who had headaches, and she went to the doctor, and they found out she only had half a brain. And she was perfectly fine, except she had headaches. So the brain is quite different from a, a digital computer. So for us to transport that into a machine or vice versa is, is science fiction. But again, there's no law of physics preventing it, but I'd say it's at least 100 years away. And final question for tonight. Um, in your talk, you had mentioned some Hollywood movies that some of us know, from Star Trek to Avatar, and I believe you've also seen Inception. So would it be correct to say that physicists are getting their ideas from Hollywood? Because all the new things that you're seeing, you're linking them back to movies. So would that be a correct statement? or? It's the other way around. <laughs> if you look at Star Trek, everything was stolen from the world of physics. Warp drive, antimatter, engines, all that came from the world of physics. So Hollywood is constantly feeding off the advances of physics decades after we've made the advance. This was a fascinating an interesting look into the future, and we all thank you for uh, spending this uh, moment with us. So let's give them a round of applause.